to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell, and today's topic is Becoming a Birder Part 3, how to use the ultimate and free birding app with NatHab Expedition Leader, Christina Disney. Thank you so much for being here today, Christina. Over to you. Thank you, Brooke, and hello, everyone. Thanks for sticking it out with the Becoming a Birder series. I'm very excited to keep this going. And I wanted to throw this up as a quick option. This is by no means no pressure point. No one has to, but I know some people like to sort of keep themselves busy while they listen and watch in. So if anyone wants to, you are welcome to go and put the app on your phone while we're talking, or I'm guessing some of you might have already done that. Great either way. There's also no pressure to. We're going to walk through kind of how the app works. Um, and a few of its features today. So I just know that's kind of a fun follow along. Or again, it's just an opportunity. If you go back and watch the replay, you can just kind of listen and enjoy now and come back to it later. But I wanted to get you the option of that before we got rolling. So yeah, hi everyone. We are back. We've made it through a few different rounds of things. Um, and I don't know if anyone was there for our, or folks who were, who were there for our part one. Uh, if you remember when Kendall asked, what about the apps and I held off, I held off for a couple webinars because I think it's so good that we build some of our own personal observational skills, right? Um, I was talking about this a little bit beforehand, you know, we can, we can learn all sorts of things, but we need to be able to have an association with it if we want to remember it, if it wants to become part of our own story. So that's where we're going to take off today. And for folks who are just tuning in now, to give you an idea of, of what we've sort of walked along so far, Part one was really just about admitting that the world of birding can be kind of scary and kind of intimidating. And it's one of those ones where I still, to this day, as an expedition leader, don't really call myself a birder because I feel like I'm looking over my shoulder being like, am I really a birder? Do I know enough about birds? Um, so really, we just kind of went down to the bare bones, to the basics, and we started from this idea of shape and locomotion and how that relates to our birds' uh, niches in, the, in their environments, how they literally move through the world, and how if we can start to understand some of those ratios between their, their limbs, their tail, and their wing, and how that moves, we can already start to group different birds and make different uh, assumptions about them, right? And we even started thinking about the inside, and you know, we think about hollow bones and how that bone structure comes into play with different birds, right? So this one here was a, a rock pigeon we were looking at, uh, and which ones are hollow and which ones are not, right? Because not all their bones are hollow. That's a big misconception. And then our last episode in part two, we were rolling through some ducks, right? We're, we, again, not too worried about specific species just yet, but this idea of we've got divers and we've got dabblers. And those are two different livelihoods, right? Our divers are our fishers. They're the ones that need to get deep down. Um, so when we look at them, when we're looking at the water, you can look the ring neck in the bottom left corner. That's a diving duck. They kind of sit lower. And the cool thing is because they can actually compress their feathers against their body. They get rid of more air trap between them, which allows them to go deeper down. Whereas dabblers, those are more of your cartoon notion of that duck where they just kind of flip themselves upside down, got their legs in the air, and they come back up, right? Those are going after necessarily less fish, but more different vegetation, uh, insects, crustaceans, things like that that they can get along the bottom. And again, if we go back to what we learned in part one, we can think about center of gravity, right? These things that you might not know, you might have never seen that duck before, but you can just kind of even look at the way it sits in the water, or in this case, the way it stands. And the idea being that if you're a diving duck, your feet are closer to the back because you're using them as some fun flippers, um, kind of stand up a little bit more erect, whereas our dabbling ducks, their feet are more towards the center of their body. They kind of do a fun little wobble on land, and they look like they're a little bit shorter down. Right, so the idea of building in these clues to figuring out where they fit into the world, um, into the world that they live in, right? Just based off of what we can see of them initially. And then the next level after that is starting to do some basic features of identification. And so that's where we played the game, where's the white, right? Birds are beautiful. They come in all these different colors and they've got these sheens to their feathers and it's terribly exciting but also really confusing. And especially if you can't see them from really far away or you don't have a pair of binos on you or they're just sort of like a silhouette-ish in the pond on the sunlight. You're like, I don't know what that is. I can't tell. Well, really we've worked it down to the point um, where some of the key features, you can do so much identification just by looking at where the white is on a bird. So these three birds here, we've got the green winged teal, the northern shoveler, the American wigeon, right? You could argue that these are all white, green, and brown 
ducks, right? It doesn't really help you tell which one is the difference. And we can work on some other features too. But the notion is that if we put them into a black and white spectrum, then there's much more key identifying features than just be saying to your friend, hey, I saw this green and brown duck, right? The green winged teal, I like to call it the sash or the shoulder, the shoulder patch. The shoveler, right, it's got that nice big collar, wide breast, and it's got that sort of window of white hanging on the rear. And then our widgeon, in comparison, it has that stripe along the top, and it also has a comparable window. And again, this is a great time when we're thinking about identifying different birds, is that we always want multiple lines of evidence, right? So again, if I just say it was a green and brown duck, that doesn't help you very much, but maybe it narrows you down to at least these three. Then if I can say, hey, it was a green and brown duck with a really big bill, ooh, we're getting closer to a shoveler. Or if we can get it down to, oh, it kind of had like a lighter, uh, more of a roundish head, right? Those are features when we think about shape and size that seem really intimidating at first, but it's all just about slowing down and working through one at a time. And I know birds never slow down for us, right? I mean, maybe it seems like a, a silly thing to say because they never hold still just for that perfect image. Um, but the more comfortable we get with them, the more we just need to see a couple pieces of evidence at a time. So last time we kind of ended off uh, with one of the resources that you can get from Cornell Lab, which is you can get, buy yourself a field guide, just a little paper copy one to keep in your pocket. And I'm a big fan of keeping physical guides. I know this whole app is, um, oh, sorry, this whole webinar is about walking through the app and all the really cool uses that it has. But this is, and I'll go through this again probably a little later on, but probably one of the biggest reasons why I think a field guide is so good and something physical, it's the, the idea between a Google search and a library. You can only search for what you can think to ask. Right, that's one of the biggest things, and you can, you know, people make this joke about millennials and iPhones and all those things. That's really the biggest difference between, if you go to a library, you don't have to know to ask, you're gonna get shown all sorts of things, and then you're left for yourself to choose a book title, or in this case, to choose pattern recognition, to see all the birds that you might see. If you're only searching, you can only see one thing at a time, generally, and you have to know what to ask for. Even Merlin, which is really so good at narrowing down, and it does seem like it's magic sometimes, can only tell you what you ask it. It will only iterate back to you what you've given it, right? And so I love having a library. I am a junkie. I always have way too many field guides with me, and I probably never use them half the time. And you could really say that, Christina, those are more like emotional support than they are for actual identification. And you're right. I can't really disagree with that. But the essence is that if I know I always have the library, then I can make those choices myself. And I think that's a big part of learning autonomy that we're shifting away from with a lot of apps. And that's okay. There's a whole different skill set that we're developing and all these cool, cool features that we're gonna walk through. But I think that that type of autonomy is something that's really important to hold on to. So we're gonna jump into the app. We're gonna do it. Um, and again, just a reminder, this is like that saying, teach a person to fish rather than give them the fish. I am not here to give you every single bird or every single group of bird, but the hope out of this is that we all get more comfortable. We don't we don't sweat this or don't sweat the small stuff, and be able to build the skills. Right? I want you to be able to learn how to look. Uh, some folks might know this who followed along over the years with me, but I run a community science monitoring program uh, when I'm not out with NatHab, and just oh, so such a big piece of that that translates into birding and so many things really, is the idea of learning to observe. Everyone's already taking in this information. You, your brain is taking in so much info, but you can start training it to think of patterns that you want to find. And all of a sudden birds won't seem so complex. You know, there's still gonna be complications. You'll still have to you know, learn along the way. But just know that everything you already need, you've already got it. You just have to learn to train some new skills in a new way. All right, so let's do this. Let's think about Merlin. What and who is Merlin, right? Well, you'd think with it being a birding app that it would be named after the bird Merlin. Well, which uh, if you're not already familiar with, Merlins are birds of prey. You can actually see it's got its unfortunate snack there. Well, again, this is always a fun thing when you show people predator prey photos, whether they're on the side of the prey or whether they're side on the predator. You can either feel bad for the prey or feel relieved for the bird, for the Merlin. But either way, uh, they're relatively smaller bird of prey the male wings, the falcon wings, they come in around around 20 to 24 inches. Females are a little bit bigger. Um, and they hunt other birds. That's their, their primary prey, right? Sparrows, quail, things like that. 
And so in the past, humans' relationship to them was varied. They've all been, they've always been really popular in, in falcon, falconry. I want to say falconry, but I think it is falconry. Someone can, someone can leave a comment if I've said it the wrong way around. Um, but one thing that I thought was cool is they used to be called the lady hawks because these were the preferred hawks, or excuse me, preferred falcons that uh, the nobility, the women used to use in order to catch skylarks. Today, um, it's been interesting to see their population sort of rebound. They're one of the, the probably more success stories following the removal of DDT from a lot of environments. Um, and so while other birds of prey, you know, the story varies, Merlins are actually doing generally better. Another reason why they're doing better is because Merlins are actually really well adapted to urban environments. And so I brought this up uh, last time when we were talking about mallards, right? Mallards are thriving in artificial environments like parks things that we're creating. Well, Merlins are doing really well because what they are avian predators. What sur survives and thrives in a lot of our cities? Lots of pigeons, right? So essentially, Merlins are becoming an urban adapted bird, not exclusively, you're still finding them in the wild, but the reality is that they're doing really, really well. This is actually a, a photo of a bird that got taken down in Iceland, right, uh, in a parking lot. So kind of crazy to think about. But all I have to say, Merlin is a very cool bird and hopefully one that you'll start sort of tracking now, especially for some of our urban folks, right? Birding is still 100% a thing that we can do in cities. Uh, but that's not where the Merlin name came from, actually. Merlin was not named for the bird. Merlin the app was named for the wizard, the King Arthur legend. And this is just a quick aside because I think life is funny this way. Um, I'd never heard of King Arthur being labeled as one of the nine worthies uh, until I was in... Uh, I went and saw Shakespeare, went and saw the two gentlemen of Verona, and I've heard it twice in one week, and so it feels like there's something, there's a lesson I'm supposed to learn from this, so just bringing you guys along with the story. I'll report back on the third one, on the next, uh, the next Verity webinar, if I figure out what the lesson is I'm supposed to learn from the Nine Worthies. But yeah, it was named for Merlin the Wizard, and I did not grow up with uh, the, you know, the old books of legend. I grew up with the Disney Merlin, and this is the Merlin, right? Uh, it was created with the idea that they named the, they named Merlin the app uh, in the hopes that it would provide this magical way of guessing what bird you were staring at. And again, in true Merlin fashion, even in the, the 19, oh gosh, is this the 90s, Sword in the Stone? Even in that, Merlin is this great mix of magic and science. And so really the magic behind pressing those buttons on the app is driven by some really astounding and really impressive uh, citizen science that happened all around the world and accumulated in a really beautiful way. So with that, that is the Merlin that is gonna guide us into the world of birding and to using the app to the most of its benefit. And yeah, into the brave new, brave new world of birding we go. So the idea of the app was hatched actually quite a while ago, back in 2009, and they wanted an interactive tool to help people identify birds. And this was made possible through lots of different funders, um, Cornell, lab. Um, I'm usually not one to sort of shamelessly promote, but I just think this is such a great example of an academic lab or institute taking its work and really putting it for good in so many different ways. So I just big shout out to those folks. They've really done a lot of great work. And they've taken and distilled observations from literally, I think it's close to 800 million observations now that are in um, sort of driving this information that we're, we're using to find the app. And they boiled it down. There's a few different ways to use Merlin. The one that, you know, the big kind of the big shiny tools, the first one is the five questions. So it asks you, it's, you know, again, based on size, colors, some behavior, some habitat, things like that. The second avenue is you can give Merlin a photo. So you can actually upload a photo and then it will cross reference it visually, right? Because birds are all about patterns, very predictable. And so that's pretty freaking amazing, right? The world we're moving into with different AI technology is kind of wild. Um, what we'll be able to do as far as biodiversity coming up. And of course there's the sound, right? Um, but really it's this idea that Merlin is now a, a library of birds of nearly 6,000 different species that's become what really can be the most updated field guide and adaptable field guide that you can carry with you, right? As much as I love my heavy backpack, uh, I can't always bring all my guidebooks with me. There is a limit to how many things I can carry. You can also say there's a limit for how long your phone battery is. So there's a there's an argument to be made on each side. Um, and of course, as we said in the title, it is free, which is so unbelievable. Um, and there's just one thing 
I kind of wanted to bring up before we move into that. I feel like people, when they hear something is free, our society has this thing to misvalue it and this idea that if it's free, it means maybe it doesn't have value, um, right? And that's not, or like, oh, it's free, so I don't need to work as hard for it. This is a really classic thing. They've done studies on this, right? Where if they make someone pay for a course, they value it more than if it was a free course. This comes up all the time. Uh, I'm probably just as guilty of it as the next person, right? If it's a free thing, it's like, oh, it's okay. It'll always be there for me. Um, and I hope that Merlin, Merlin always will. That's not what I was implying with that. What I was more so implying was that there are some things that you shouldn't put a price on, right? And the idea of not putting a price on this has such a benefit to so many individuals, um, so many regions, so many ecosystems, right? That the idea that it can be funded so that it is free for everyone is such a huge impact. So I wanted to show you before we sort of jumped into birds specifically, as that this is a map of bird conservation regions for North, it's the North America Bird Conservation Initiative. And it was put together uh, between Canada, the States and Mexico, because birds really are this unifying animal, right? So many, especially in North America, um, and going a bit down into Central America, but our birds are migratory. They are connecting ecosystems and people across hundreds, if not thousands of miles. And so that means that what happens in one place affects what happens in another. And people notice that, right? They notice when some of like, you know, less geese come home once, you know, after, uh, after a summer up north. They notice when um, we lose, uh, synch uh, with climate change, right? We're losing synchronization. So what's happening is that birds who are, who are migrating based on some daylight, they're actually coming into conflict because they're arriving places before their food has started to grow or where it's already later on and they've missed some of the prime prime feeding right so people are noticing these things and they're important and how and how are we supposed to track that and understand that um well we get everyone involved right and i just really appreciated this this was cornell labs mission is to interpret and conserve the earth's biological diversity through research education and citizen science focus on birds and nature so that is a pretty good call and a pretty good tagline. And it is a song I am very happy to sing. So let's do this. Let's break down how I can use Merlin um, to the best of our abilities and to understand things. So folks who already have the app, you're welcome to follow along. Folks who don't, just kind of follow along and then maybe go back to the recording later. Or hopefully this gives you enough of your first round of skills that you can jump off and get birding on your own. So this is, the, uh, this is the screen you're gonna see once you download the app and log in, create your first account. This is what you're gonna land on. And everyone always wants to go to the step-by-step. -step. They want to do the, the, the identify first. That's the most exciting button. You're like, ooh, I'm just gonna ask a bunch of questions and Merlin is gonna magically show me all the things. But we're gonna go somewhere else first. Well, the first place everyone needs to go is you need to go into your settings. And the reason you need to go there is because you need to get yourself a bird pack. So this is a global resource, but in order to be able to use this offline, you need to be able to tap into different locations as you need. I also love that they call it bird packs because it makes me think of like old baseball trading cards. Uh, and the idea of like, we're all trading all these bird cards. I don't know, that's, that's where my mind goes. So once you get into these bird packs, you're gonna have the ones you already installed, and then you, you can already help you out by telling you which ones you need for your area, in case you don't know, right? So North America is pretty simple. I had the Canada West one already. I threw on the US and the continental one. Um, depending on how much traveling you're doing and how much space you have on your phone, you're not really limited by that usually these days. Um, so feel free to throw a few on. You can always delete a package too, and then reinstall it later if you need it. So this is great, but this is this is the most important thing to remember. If you're going traveling, you probably, or you you know, we're in a world where you do have Wi-Fi where you're going. Um, but if you're going somewhere new and you wanna learn about those birds, you need to get the pack that makes sense for the area that you're going to, right? So where, would you know, whichever continent you're traveling to, whichever region, I specifically love that they have also the Atlantic Ocean, right? Think about more of our, our ocean going people. Um, best about a, less about a lo specific location, right? You have all of these migrating birds. So make sure that you get your bird pack ready before you go. That's the best thing. Okay, so we've got now the list of birds that we need. We've got our bird trading cards. Let's go check them out. Let's start by exploring them. So this is what it's gonna look like when you open up the explore page. And so this is already what's great about this is that it's already narrowed down 
the birds I'm most likely to see. I'm here on Vancouver Island, so that's how come it's queued into San HBC. And this is so extremely underemphasized that I, I want to take a minute so that we can all appreciate how much effort has gone in behind this very small, simple statement. So for me today, there are 250 likely birds near Saanich, BC. Okay, the hardest thing about birding, truly, that takes years to just be dialed in and know what you need to know, is what birds can I expect to see where I am now? So, right, we've got migratory species, we have different breeding patterns, all of those things are super complex. They are specific for each species. That's the part that's one of the, the learning curves that's really overwhelming for birding is that all these birds have their own one, right? You can't just generally group it and say, this is going to be here in August, this one's going to be here in May, etc. So the fact that just already, and I know 200 seems like a lot, but trust me, we can narrow that down, you know, even smaller. Even just that it can say there are 200 birds likely near you today for where you are, that goes to show how much amazing effort has gone into this app and resource that's available to you. It's done, it's done, you know, five years of birding work for you to narrow down who can you expect to see in this area. So I just want to do a big shout out. There's nearly 800 million observations. That is 800 million times that people have seen something and wanted to contribute to something greater. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about citizen science um, is that you really can show how your individual observations can go uh, to building something greater. Building's been, or excuse me, birding has been one of the most successful citizen science things since citizen science has even been something to call it. But let's work through this. So that today thing, we wanna talk about it species by species. Um, so again, if we go back, you guys remember some of the divers we were talking about, when we were doing our doc webinar. So I brought up the, can I brought the, the common organza back, the canvas back and the golden eye. And again, what are some things that we can tell that these are diving ducks, right? So they're sitting lower in the water. Diving ducks, anyone remembers from part two, made this bit of a joke. They look more like a zebra. They're usually generally black and white, um, right? So we're seeing less of that color range, which holds pretty true, right? We've got a bit of a greenish hue in the golden eye. We've got that sort of rougey, uh, I'll say like wine red, but that's not quite the red, white red either uh, for the canvas back. But generally, they're much more white and black and they're sitting a bit lower in the water. So it looks like we're looking at some divers, that's great. Now the information we're getting from Merlin when we were talking about that are here today, and this is so cool, is that those bar charts at the bottom, there's a, so much value jam packed into those. So those are showing you for where you're at, when would you expect to see them during the time that you're there? So let's focus in on the merganser, right? So they're showing up uh, so we're near sort of end of August here. So for right now, they're relatively rare. Ooh, there we go. Relatively rare. Okay, so this is a picture that I took of some common organzers when I was doing some field work back on June 14th. And so that's giving you an idea of how many, you know, we're seeing them sort of at the tail end of how often we would expect to see them. Uh, one thing that's kind of cool, I think, to po point out in this photo is that you can see our mama duck there. She's got her all her little babies uh, behind her, which is a lot, right? Seems like that's a lot for one duck. Well, if you look at the second duck on shore, it's not a male, it's a female, right? So we've got aunties here that are taking care of all the little babies. Um, and most likely that's a mixed batch, right? So this was actually really fun. So this was June 14th. Yesterday I was out doing field work and I was about three kilometers up the river from where I took this photo, and I saw them all again, and they're almost full grown. They haven't fully fledged out yet, um, but they're almost ready to fly. So it's been really cute. I'm also, which is slightly more sad, there's not that many anymore, I'm not gonna lie, um, but that's how, how the world works, right? I think when I saw them yesterday, there was about eight left, so hopefully those ones make it to adulthood. They're doing great though. Um, but what I wanted to bring attention was, when you think about that seasonal bar, you're looking at different life phases and different trends, and you're looking at their habits and migration. So, um, oh yeah, let's do a pause on this. Let's let's go back, let's do work in a little bit of identification. So there are three mergansers you can expect to see. They're all divers, they're all eating some fishes. Um, so there's the hooded merganser, which is in the bottom left here. Then we've got the red breast at the bottom and the common merganser. The hooded merganser has got such a wicked hairdo that it's usually pretty to easier easier to tell that it's him. The two that are harder to tell apart, especially for the females, are the common merganser and the red-vested merganser. 
So let's put to work some of those skills that we honed in part two, and let's play Where's the White? Now, last time, folks remember, I only played Where's the White with male ducks. The game is much harder with female ducks, but we're, so we're leveling up. We've got some of those skills now. We're ready to, ready to put them into motion. So these look fairly similar off the get-go, but the things I want you to notice, right, the most, the most obvious where's the white, right, is that little sliver of white we can see on the common merganser in the back. But again, you have to be careful with little patches like that because as the birds ruffle their feathers, as they dive, that's not always a... Uh, not always a dead giveaway so you can have a false negative I guess is what I'm trying to say right the feathers could be ruffled in such a way that you might not see that patch but if you do see it you for sure more likely got your common organzer the next thing and I know we said where's the white um, and it's more of a gray you could argue but the next thing that's really important to look at when we're just talking about color so I want you to look at their throat so if you take the time to look at the red breast of Merganser's throat, it's kind of, it's got some gray, but it sort of does this gentle fade, right? And then it changes and the color pattern, there's no definitive line when it goes um, between that lighter, lighter color and then that darker brown. Whereas if you look at the common Merganser, the common Merganser has like your color. They're very British, you know, I mean, I'm making assumptions here, but you know, that lawyer color that you would expect to see when they have to wear their wigs. Um, and so that's a really definitive cutoff on the head, right? So we could use just that, just looking at the throat patch. And if we get that little white patch at the back, if we were looking at a, at a flock of these to be like, hey, I see a common merganser. Uh, but while we're here, let's focus on a couple other things too that can help us out. Uh, so, cause hopefully, I'm hoping that for some folks who are living, mergansers have a really big range and they're a very fun duck to get to see. So hopefully someone can go out this week and find themselves a merganser. But what I want you to look at now is I want you to look at the profile of the nose. So if you look at the profile of our red breasted at the top, it's a very definitive down and out and over. And actually there's, uh, whereas if you look at our common merganser, you've got that long sloping nose, right? Uh, also the merganser bill is a little bit thicker uh, going with that. So that's another dead giveaway. They do have really fun hairdos, right? The the red breasted has the one that's more cut off at the back, whereas the you could say that the common is more frayed out. But depending on if again if they just came up from a dive, if they're if, you know if their feathers are perfectly out, then yes, those are great identifiers. But they can always look a bit more smushed and it can always kind of make you second guess. But here I just gave you a few different examples of some lines of evidence you can use, right? So we can use where's the white, we can use bill shape and we can use hairdo if we needed to to figure out what these mergansers are um but i wanted to bring it back to so who can we be expecting to see come august so this is the part that i think it's important and as you start to learn about birds the part that makes it exciting for me as i get over my general fear of birders is that it's tying in what is going on in that bird's world you know why is it here now and where does this fit into sort of its role in the ecosystem so as I said, the ones that I saw yesterday have just about fledged out, which is pretty awesome. They're going to be ready to leave mom here probably in the next week or two even. It only takes them around two weeks, to, uh, or sorry, two weeks, I said it again. It takes around two months-ish for them to reach adult size. And then in the fall, they raft up. So they often form uh, female rafts and male rafts. So all the mergansers here that you're looking at are all females. And this is a great actually example to see how, so these are all merganser females, and you can see how some of them, that white patch is really distinct and you can see it on the side. Some of them it's harder to find. So again, those ID things. Can, and then also look at the hairdos, right? Some of these are more distinctly that kind of nice frayed out sort of mohawk look, and some of them because it looks like they've maybe came up from a dive more recently, or they've been doing some uh, some tidying of their, their, their fine feathers. Um, it's a little more compact right but once you get comfortable with a few key features then you'll be ready for the exceptions so this time of year we are expecting them to finish raising their young soon to be heading off into rafts and then come winter is when they're going to pair up with their with their males and then go hang out somewhere for the winter and we usually find them on lakes or rivers uh generally they like the, the good moving water these good fishers do right and so this is when we look at where we can expect to find them uh, this is the whole map here, right? So purple is where we would expect to find them year round. So now that's where I am. I'm on Vancouver Island. So I'm hanging out right here. So this map 
And here's where you start to have to kind of start connecting some of the dots of yourself of what Merlin is telling you. This map says that they're, they're here all year round. But if we go look at the seasonal bar that Merlin gives me for my area, you can see that, well, yeah, they're here all year round, but they're not here as much in the summertime, or we would expect them you know, less often on the island, but then we start to see more of them again. So what is that about? Well, all this orange are breeders who've gone north. And so when they come back, they're gonna supplement the populations that stayed here. So that's when we're gonna see more of them over those winter seasons. And then the reverse is gonna happen come next spring. Uh, a lot of those other breeders are gonna go north, and the ones that, you know, some of our year round ones, they're going to stay there. And the non breeding are ones that are not making that, uh, not making that voyage, right? Okay, the next feature that I want to talk about, and we're going to shift to some sea ducks for this one. So they're still divers, right? Uh, but we're going to shift to the scoter, the surf scoter. And Lord, I hope I said that the right way because I, uh, always stress about it every time I think about it because I always want to say scotter or scoter or scouter or scooter. I wish it was scooter. I'm not going to lie. I wish that they were called surf scooters. I think it would be way more fun, but all of the people who I do know do birds correct me every time I say it. So I accept that it is a scotter and I will continue to pronounce it as such. Um, but this was the feature I wanted to bring up to you next. So the bar shows you the general um, sorry, to give you the detailed story and then the circle at the top. So if it's full red, it means that they're rare. And if you get that orange with only half full, it means they're relatively uncommon. But I wanted to think about that uncommon notion with what we're seeing on the bar at the bottom, right? So if you remember, an interesting thing here is that it looks like there's quite a few of them around given the bar. I'm just going to jump back two slides. I should put this on the point. Whereas the merganser, is more rare but look it's you know it's based on how often you expect to see it so let's talk about what is going on with the scotter and why is it uncommon right or what's what's actually going on for these birds that they have that that subtle shift where there seems like there's quite a few in the winter time and then there's slightly less of them in the summer but not all of them go so this is kind of a cool thing about surf scotters is that we find them a lot in the pacific northwest there's about half a million or so that breed along the coast of bc um, and we know a fair amount about them while they're out at sea, but we actually don't know a super lot about them when they go to breed. So most of their breeding we know happens um, way up north, anywhere from western Alaska all the way across to Labrador. And so there's, as far as we know, we, we don't know about a lot of breeding that happens in the province here itself. So this map here is kind of cool because while they spend a lot of time out on the sea, they do a lot of their breeding um, in inland freshwaters that are quite remote. And so these are places where we think that they're possibly breeding here in BC, um, but we don't even have it really confirmed. So here's something again that goes to show there's always so much more to be learned. Um, but I wanna tie this back into that seasonal bar that it's showing us, which is that, so the non-breeders are the ones that stay in the summertime and the ones that are breeding are the ones that go up north. So even though we still have quite a few around here, this is a cool thing you can automatically see. Right. So now if you're saying, hey, if I see a surf scotter in the summertime, we know that that one isn't breeding. Uh, it either didn't get pregnant or it was a juvenile. Right. So you've already informed yourself about the life cycle of where that bird is at, which is pretty cool just by knowing the time of the year. Uh, now, this one, again, I want to think about that seasonal bar and the implication of it, of what we're seeing, um, because Merlin is designed to give you snippets of things. Um, but the juicy stuff is about understanding what's driving Merlin. So this is a tufted puffin. Tufted puffins are much, much more rare than our surf scotter friends. And um, this can't go well, thinking about this bird came out of a conversation I had with another guy, Eddie Savage, uh, who I was talking to him this spring. And I was helping out with some of the high biologistics and he was heading up there with a new, with the group. And I asked him how his last trip was. And he was like so happy, so stoked because he sent me a picture of a tufted puffin. They are really rare to see. Um, and Hyde Gwaii is one of the places that you do get a chance to go see them, which is pretty cool. Uh, and this is why they're hard to see. If most of us spent our lives out at sea, maybe we would see them more often. Uh, but the reality is that most of our breeders, you know, they're going to be close to coasts while that's happening. But most of our non-breeders very rarely come anywhere near shore, right? They're quite, they're quite far out there. And so if you're not sailing through the Pacific, you don't really get to come across these, these fun looking birds very often. 
If you are lucky enough to see them and you have a chance to see them with their mouth full of fish, it's not because they're hoarders or they're trying to snack them all at once. Uh, the adults, when they dive, they actually eat their fish for themselves while they're underwater. But that's what they're going to bring back to their young. So they go, they can catch a bunch of fish, they can keep even 20 in their bill at a time, and then they take those back to their nests. The nests of their choice, maybe not where you and I would like to call home, but they are cliff nesters. Um, and they like to go into little burrows and tuck in against things, right? And they can go quite a ways in. They can even go like three feet or more uh, into a burrow. Uh, which I guess makes sense if, you're, if your front doorstep is right off the edge of a cliff, hey? It makes sense why you'd want to burrow down. So we have not even gotten to some of the fun, fancy tools yet, and we're hopefully already learning about some really cool ways that Merlin can inform us. Uh, we're going to stay on the Explore page. So this is what we were talking about. That's just the information of what it pops up for generally what's there. You can get the next level you already have an inkling of what you're hoping to find or what you're already looking for by using the bird bar on the right. So again, this comes back to what we learned together in our first webinar. This idea that shape and pattern recognition, um, you know, we can think about it strictly as what does the silhouette look like? But if you look at all of those birds on the left side, hopefully you can take a stab at what kind of, how do they fly? What type of um, ecosystem they live in, right? So even without me telling you, and I know some of these are already familiar, right? But we can think about a bird that's got really big, broad wings, that bird probably wants to soar, right? If you think about a bird that's got a really long beak, it's probably trying to peck at some things, right? Or when those legs being really straight up, that's kind of a shorebird cue. And so it's thinking about, and that's what Merlin is relying on. It's using your very simple pattern recognition from things we start learning from kids without even realizing it um, to narrow down what kind of animal you think you're seeing. So some of those first few birds are pretty easy uh, or generally pretty easy for people to pick up on because they follow some, some you know, broader groups that we're, we're generally more familiar with. So we might not know what species we're looking at, but we all feel pretty comfortable saying, I think I'm looking at a duck or at least a goose or a waterfowl, right? You can kind of narrow it down into there. Um, same with our raptors, right? You're like, that looks like it wants to eat something, right? It's look like it's a big sore. That makes sense of the osprey there as an example. Um, where people start to get a little more hung up on are the little dudes. The little dudes, this I think is where the full like alarm bells ring in your head and you say, oh no, this is too much. It's just a, it was just a flash of color. I'll never figure out what it was. Okay, everyone, deep breath. One, two, three. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, don't panic. We're good. The most important thing is that you have fun out there. Whether you figure out actually what it is or not, it's honestly secondary. But the first thing that's always so good is to start from something that you know. Because you are, again, you already know so, so much. So let's start with someone that I'm guessing almost everyone has seen, or if not, has seen in a book, right? A robin. Robins belong to the thrush family. And so we can think about what do we know about a robin and suddenly use that to characterize what we can think about if we're looking at a thrush or not. So robins are generally kind of small to medium sized bird, right? You can kind of roughly visualize where a robin is in your head and you're like, okay, so most thrushes are around the size of a robin. It's a pretty good starting point. Might be a little bigger, a little smaller, but there's somewhere for your brain to start thinking about a pattern from. And they feed on the ground. Right? Look at this robin pulling out such a juicy, juicy worm. So if we're looking for a bird that's an insectivore that's feeding on the ground, that gives us a big clue. Right? And that's, that's really a good enough starting point. Then you can go click on that button and then Merlin is going to give you, hey, did your bird look like this? Did your bird sound like that? Right? Um, and again, this is us trying to get you to have some of those skills. There's a reverse way to give Merlin even less details and get you there. But the point is to show you that you already know enough to start getting into some of these bird families on your own. Let's check out another one. This is a wren. What in the world is a wren? What defines a wren? Um, I often try to avoid Latin names when I'm talking about different animals because I find that they just mostly confuse us. But every now and again, Latin names can actually, when you, when you get the translation of them, they can help you figure out uh, some traits about the animal that you're looking for. So the Pacific wren, is Trogloides pacificus, which the pacificus again just refers to 
the location side of it, but tr uh, uh, tr trilogodites, there we go, respond. It's, uh, it means those who dwell in a cave. Now, wrens are not cave dwellers, but wrens love nooks and crannies and anywhere that's teeny tiny that they can get into, that's where they want to be, that's where they're going to have their homes. So this is a cool quote from a guy named Max Nicholson. He was a big birder uh, in, uh, well, not the, two, it's so crazy to say the 20th century, but you know, the, the, that, that century we just had in the 1900s. The wren cannot ad be adequately described as a bird of woodlands, gardens, fields, moors, marshes, cliffs, or wastelands. Although it is all of these, but must be looked at as, rather as a bird of crevices and crannies, of wood piles and fallen trees, of hedge bottoms and banks, walls and boulders, wherever these may occur. All right, think about what you can now think about. That was a funny sentence. But think about what you've got to work on now when you're out there. Those little tiny flitting birds that are right on the forest floor or you know in that dark crevice, and it seems like they move around so fast that you're like, was that a bird or was that a mouse? Those are our wrens. They're very, very small, right? Uh, and that's the lifestyle, right? So rather than thinking about what is a wren, think about what little bird do I see in a little crevice or cranny? That's a way better way to start grounding yourself. And then you can start clicking on Merlin and be like, hey, what kind of wrens live here? This is what I saw uh, hanging out of, uh, you know, in the forest when I was going for a walk. This is what I saw in my neighbor's backyard uh, in the garden, right? And again, you know, there's still those insectivores, they're still kind of hunting around to, to get little pieces. And uh, another great thing about wrens is that uh, a classic line is that you'll often hear them before you see them, right? So these are ones where, especially with their coloring and especially with their proclivity to hide in little small places or, to, you know, to be in the underbrush, you might not see them. And that's okay. And this is kind of what's going to veer us into some of Merlin's other awesome skills is the idea of sound. Right, so um, I always am so amazed if you ever watch a wren sing, and I'm gonna play this for you, but if you ever watch them sing, it looks like their, their mouth is moving at a rate the, that the sound isn't coming out, and you're like, how is that the same creature? Um, so it goes really fast, right? There's a Pacific wren for you. And so, right? They're the little chatterboxes that are following you through the woods or that, you know, you, you, they're very territorial too, especially the males. So when you get up in their space, they're like, hey, 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 back up. This is my little corner of the woods. Um, and so there's, right, this is, again, one of the greatest gifts from Merlin. That's where I just played that sound clip from you. So when you download that bird pack, you're not just getting all the visuals, you're going to get the sound cues too. Uh, and don't worry, we're going to talk about that later. I haven't forgotten about how to roll through some of those things. Um, but I want to talk about one more bird family before we keep going here, which are the warblers. And what is a warbler? Another great, wonderful word to say. It makes me want to be a, a wood warbler tongue twister of some kind. Like, how much wood could a wood warbler? Yeah, I'll leave that alone. I'll, I'll leave the bad jokes alone. But a warbler, if we go by definition, is anything that makes a warbling sound. I always hate definitions that use the same word to define them. Really, it just means that it's something that goes, uh, a sound that rises and falls. It can be a musical trill, uh, has a nice melody, maybe, maybe not, depending on your own, uh, your own ear. Um, but in this case, we're talking about small insect-eating birds. Here's a very cool drawing uh, that can show you some of the ones you can expect to see in the eastern United States. Now, this, I will full-on admit, this is where I think another line where, like, your kind of heart stops and you're, you know, when you're looking at this page, you're like, how am I supposed to learn which one is which? And, you know, as owl friend here likes to remind, this is also, I think, a point in birding where you get like historical, um, I want to say relevance or the way that biology has evolved, has evolved in a way that can be exclusive to people. And and I, what I mean by that is the science itself, not the actual organisms. So back in the day when we were naming things, if it looked similar, we called them the same things. That's a pretty reasonable way to name something. It seems fair now, right? So there were literally hundreds of birds that were named warblers back in the day. Now, with the advent of DNA and being able to understand genetics from the inside out and seeing who's related to who and who's not, it has completely messed with the naming system of common names when we call something a warbler. So globally, there used to be, uh, you know, 
hundreds of birds that were all called warblers. And then once they finally started doing DNA sequencing, we now realize that they're, for the birds that are quote unquote called warblers, there are 13 different families on six different continents, which almost have very little to do with each other. Because back in the day, they were just named, are you the same color? Do you eat the same things? Do you live in the same places? Cool, you're a warbler. And that's like a headache waiting to happen. Because that's about to say like, wait, so a warbler is not a warbler? And so this is the part where when we're room, when you know when we're moving in scientific circles, things like scientific and Latin names make sense. Because it's something that we all agree on. But for the average person, when someone tells us that they see a warbler, we're not gonna go check which of the 13 families it actually is and use that to help figure it out. This is this is where the headache comes in. Now I will say that there is some saving grace for us here in North America, which is that our warblers more or less besides two of them, all belong to the family of, um, uh, let's see if I can get this one right, Perula, Perulidae. My Latin's getting rusty, not that it was ever great. Uh, and so that actually, that's great. It means that we don't have to think about is a warbler a warbler a warbler. It's just, there's a family of birds. And if it's a family, it means they're all gonna share a common set of traits. And that's the most important thing to remember. Warblers are fun, they're beautiful, they're colorful. Uh, a lot of them are, right? And they have great patterns and they like to sing, as we can tell from our, our Sound of Music warblers, right? Um, but if we think about something to tie in their life history so we can remember who and why we think that bird is a warbler, we're gonna be way better birdler. We're, excuse me, we're gonna be way better birders. And we're gonna be the birders that other people wanna go out with. Because we're not just trying to find a bird in the sky and say, oh, I saw that one, I saw that one. You're gonna be able to say, hey, here's this cool thing I know about warblers. All warblers in North America, they evolved in Central America. And what happened was, as they started to proliferate, some started to move north and come back south, which means that even today, we have non-migrating warblers that are more Central America, and then we have migrating warblers that go up to Northern Hemisphere and come back down. The second cool thing about warblers, when we think about how their evolution has come to form all the different color patterns, is that non-migrating oh, warblers that stay in the southern part, there isn't a lot of um, sexual coloration difference, right? So think about ducks. Ducks are very different. Male, very ostentatious. Female, very camouflage, very suave. Whereas males, whereas if you're a non-migrating warbler, they can both be really colorful. They're not worried about it. But our migrating ones have diverted their energy differently, which means that the males that are migrating tend to have a, a more um, vibrant color pattern. And so that's a really cool way to think, hey, am I seeing a warbler, right? You can think about, you know, if you're hanging out in, uh, if you're hanging out, you know, in Saskatchewan, Alberta, way up north, or you're in Montana, and if you look at a bird, and you're like, ooh, you know, that bird would look nice and uh, look nice down south. You're like, hey, wait, maybe that's a warbler. You can start to tie in, because think about its traits that it would evolve, right? It, it evolved in Central America. It evolved for this different ecosystem, and it expanded into ours. So you can start to tie in some really cool things with evolution to how it is that you're seeing a warbler now in Montana, which is pretty darn cool. And okay, I acknowledge that we've only gotten as far as how to get a bird pack and how to explore, but that's because there are so many cool things inside of Merlin that I am, yes, please forgive me for it, gonna split this into two. So we're gonna come back we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about some more of the bird families on that bird bar on the side. We probably won't get through all of them, but again, the point is not to give you the birds, it's to teach you how to bird. So we'll go through a couple more families so that we can kind of get an, uh, get some more skills built up along the way. And we'll do some stuff with sound too. Don't worry, the sound part is, uh, is very fun and still coming. And then uh, we will also, you know, play with some, I know the identify button is the fun button, right? That's the one that you, you get to use and Merlin just tells you, oh my gosh, it must be one of these three birds. Um, so we'll work our way into some of that. Um, but really what I wanna do also next time is talk about how once you've got these skills, you can be one of the people who contributes back to this conservation effort, who contributes back to those 800 million observations of birds to keep this train going. Because that's exactly how it is, right? Uh, it's hopefully the best conservation pyramid scheme we can think of, right? Where the more people we can get birding, the more awareness that we've got, and to hopefully show you some cool projects that have come out of this uh, because folks have been doing that good work. So with that, we made it through those two. Next time we'll move on, um, and I will leave the time we've got left here for questions if any folks have them.
That was fantastic, Christina. Thank you so much. I will encourage everybody, we have uh, some time here for probably about like the next five-ish minutes to review any questions. And you can go ahead and put those in your control panel. Um, yeah, we do have a lot of questions um, asking um, several that's uh, like troubleshooting type things. Mm -hmm. Is there a resource? that you know of that maybe we can even put in the follow-up email uh, that we send out to everybody of like some links to some troubleshooting things? Yeah, I know it's hard from your phone to get access to some of these things, but you can go onto Cornell Labs website and their FAQs and they do have like a whole sidebar um, under Merlin. And I can even try and find those two for a community send them on if that makes it easier. But um, yeah, if you go in there as far as like some general troubleshooting things, that can help you narrow it down. Um, and also another one, like when things are funded by things like this, feel like don't be shy to send a direct email, right? Like, you know, go through the, the general thing. But the reality is that these people want to help. So lean on that. Encourage that. That's a that's a great, great resource to, to try. The worst thing that happens is you send an email, right? Best thing happens is someone responds to you and is so stoked that you're using their app. Yeah, that's fantastic advice because I'm noticing um, I've been communicating with one of our viewers here that he's not able to see like the bird bar and I actually checked my phone and I'm not able to either. So I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> just, just you know, th things like yeah. that. But that is a fantastic resource. <laughs> the simplest one out of things like that, I would say for, and this is a general, here, here's a general app thing. So updates are tricky, especially with the age of your phone. So if, you, if, you're, if there's a feature on mine that I look at and you can't see, it's most likely that you might be running an older iteration. And the best thing that you can do when you hit trouble like that is to actually delete the app off of your phone and then like, and like not just close it, but like delete it off of your phone. And I know it's annoying, but then put it on, log back in again. Cause then what it's gonna happen is that when you do that, it should give you the most recent update. Um, and it'll force it to do that. And that's the, I would say like you're do that first, right? Like, and it's the only annoying part is you have to remember what your login was. So hopefully you got that written yeah. down somewhere. <laughs> um, or saved on your iPhone, right? But but that will save you that like do that. And then if you still have issues, then then go to the next level. But that's I also run an app for the community monitoring that we do, and that is a hundred percent fixes most of the bugs. That is fantastic advice. I think a lot of us in this call will probably have to do that too, <laughs> including me. I haven't used my phone in a while. Uh, my Merlin app. Um, but I do have a fantastic question here, and I think most of us would love to hear the answer. So in some bird guides, they use comparisons to another thing. Mm -hmm. If you have no benchmark, where do mm. you even begin when you're starting to understand these birds? Oh, yeah. Sizes. So again, this is why, like, size is the least helpful feature of a bird. <laughs> Um, and, and so again, a lot of field apps will, or yeah, a lot of field guides will say, you know, it's smaller than this, but bigger than this. Um, and this is something if you start using Merlin that you, you notice, they, they try to pick things that we already know. You know, most people kind of get that a goose is big and a, you know, a crow is pretty big and that a sparrow is small, right? So um, the biggest one out of that, I would say is that honestly, don't worry about it. Like if, if, if size is the only thing you have to go on, you you need to look at other avenues of information, and then and then use size as like the very last piece of info. Because the other thing is that like again, distance comes into play, or you know a, that might look like a small duck until you see it next to a, a northern trevor. You're like, oh, that was a you know that's a big duck, vice versa. Um, honestly, I would say save yourself the headache and don't even think about it except for the very basics like things like Merlin when you're going to do that first round of like was it the size of a raven was it smaller than a raven like, those ones are good but that's only to narrow down a big level those big paper fields they they're anticipating you being the person who's been out there for three years and again this is this is again why birding always feels like such a hard thing to break into is because it assumes a lot of knowledge that you're supposed to accumulate and you will you 100% are going to learn things along the way um but it expects a really deep learning curve. And, you know, I think it's great for people who can, who can bird every day a week from, you know, 6 a.m. to 7.15, you know, the best time when they've got sunrise and all the bird songs. But the reality is that most of us are birding visitors. We like to do it when we have a chance or, you know, we're going on a trip. Um, and so we're not relying on years of knowledge. We're relying on 
oh, those things I did a little while ago or last winter or right, the last migratory season. Um, so just, yeah, sorry, that was a big ramble. Cut yourself some slack. And I would say pick, pick other features and have that one be the furthest one down the line. That is fantastic advice. I will also use that uh, in my next time I go out with my binoculars. So we are definitely winding down here and I would just love to turn it back to you, Christina, for any closing thoughts. Thank you, Brooke. And thank you everyone who tuned in today. This has been so much fun for me to do. As many of you know, birding, I even think is kind of intimidating. Um, and not because I don't love the birds, right? I think a lot of people can echo this. It's, it just, it seems like a lot to, it seems like so much. Um, I'm intimidated by a lot of my fellow birding guides. They were teasing me actually when I started this webinar. So it goes both ways. Um, but I hope all of this comes together to give you a few more skills. It's all about tools in your pocket to just be comfortable to go out there and to use it as an excuse to bring someone else with you, right? Um, sometimes it's just a nice walk in the woods uh, and it's all the amazing things that you'll get to see, right? Yesterday I was at work and I was not looking for those McGansers, but holy smokes, was it amazing to see the same family two months later. Um, so yeah, just do it for that connection to place, do it for connection with others and please tune in. I think the next one, I'm gonna keep going with the app on September 11th and then yeah, we're going to keep the birding webinar going. I got a few more lined up, so it should be a very good time. Yes, I conveniently have the schedule pulled up right here. And yes, your next webinar is September 11th. So everybody, make sure you sign up for that. Uh, of course, we will have the links and everything available. But Christina, again, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody who tuned in today. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available soon on our website. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody.